What's up, musicologists? Welcome to Amari Music Talk. I'm Richard Cole, and this is the podcast that is always on the one. All right, so today I want to talk about musicology. I want to give this album equal time. So let's dive right on in and talk about this fantastic album. So it's 2004. So that makes this the 20th anniversary here in 2024. Uh, we know we've got the 40th anniversary of Purple Rain. Uh, I know I'm excited. I don't know what's going to drop. Well, are we getting a box set? I know we got rumors of the movie getting a 4K release. So I'm excited about that. Uh, there is a commemorative Book by Andrea Swenson would get mad and I'm excited about that but I thought I would give this album equal time because this was kind of tied into at the time the 20th anniversary of Purple Rain so you know I mean you know what does what does Prince do back in 2004 gave Purple Rain a brief acknowledgement uh, on the Grammys doing a medley of Purple Rain hits with Beyonce then he goes on to get his induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame then he drops this fantastic album and then goes on probably what was the biggest tour that he's had in quite a long time up until that point so well but before we really dive in to this album uh be sure to download if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform um if you're watching on youtube be sure you like subscribe hit the notification bell that way you'll get updates on future episodes also become a patreon supporter as well uh trying to build that up um, become a subscriber you get early access to content uh, bonus material as well so definitely jump on board and we have merchandise head over to richardcolemusic.com check out all the merchandise we have available we have recast T'Challa t-shirts we have the funky poetic bootlegs album cover t-shirts and my favorite is the brand new Amari Music Talk t-shirt all of the designs are designed by us here at Amari Communications. So head on over. Every purchase helps support this channel. And therefore we can keep making great videos such as this one. So head on over and purchase today. Links are down below. Thanks. Right, so Musicology was released on March 28th of 2004 peaked at number three on the U.S. Billboard charts and was pretty much top five in other countries as well. Um, kind of became his most successful album since Diamonds and Pearls. And I know, you know, a lot of us that's deeply entrenched in the fan base, you know, it's that thing of don't call it a comeback. He's been here for years. Even I think he's mentioned that. But you know in terms of the mainstream audience you know I remember you know albums whether it's the gold experience the rainbow children you know I would get excited about those things and be like yeah Prince is coming out with a new album and people would go Prince is still around what you know so I mean there are people that exist like that like I said it's the mainstream you know they're not the deep cut fans like we are and that's that's quite all right but 2004 was that year that reminded that mainstream of who Prince was and I think this is the beginning of Prince becoming that elder statesman as well and becoming that legacy artist and you know owning it and accepting it so you know this was this was an exciting time I know I you know this is a year that I look back fondly um, you know um, you know, especially coming off of 2003, you know, I had lost my grandmother that year, um, you know, so it was just kind of little, just that kind of gray feeling, but then 2004, and, you know, when you talk about 
music or you talk about specific artists and why we you know what they give us as far as you know sharing their talents with us you know something like you know I was joining the MP I think I joined the MPG music club that year 2004 just prior to all the musicology stuff and you know just the excitement of being part of that club and you know meeting the different people online with that and then you know the different releases the downloads and like I said you know the hype building up to this album as well and the tour you know that was just you know it, it made 2004 a really really great year for me so you know I've got some fond memories you know I'll discuss some of that a little bit later but let's get back to the statistics of musicology um, it you know like I said quickly proved to be his most successful album since Diamonds and Pearls um, reaching top five in the United States United Kingdom Germany you know and making a huge impact in charts all over the planet just about um, you know the reviews uh, were mostly positive for this album I'm only going to pick out two uh, with this and I'll interject kind of my own thoughts in this as well um, but one of the reviews um, maybe not the most positive in the world but uh, this was a pitchfork interview from that year uh, this was by Dominique Leone I think I'm pronouncing that correctly um, so these are some of the takeaways from that review. Uh, the most interesting moments on musicology come when Prince either hits on a good concept like the rich white girl who can't dance paying out for the funk in illusion coma pimp and circumstance or drops the pretense of keeping the party going all together. Uh, today slow jams are his forte. Uh, the was this the infidelity warning what do you want me to do beats Phoenix at their own game with smoother than smooth vocals and a breezy chorus that would seem close to the book on anyone else attempting light jazz pop in the future call my name is hardly as distinct but is as well excuse me but is a perfectly functional slab of lover man soul doing or excuse me, along the lines of Marvin Gaye. Typically, Prince saves his best moves for the chorus. He's still, <clears throat> he's still pop through and through as his layered harmonies impart the rather straightforward admission. I know it's only been three hours, but I love it when you call my name. And yeah, I mean, um, Illusion Coma Pimp and Circumstance for me wasn't quite my favorite track um but i love what do you want me to do because that you know especially him bringing back the lynn drum machine on quite a few tracks on this album uh to me that was one of the highlights to me it was like last heart part two uh although last heart didn't really use the lynn though but it kind of, and, but that mood that tempo uh was kind of along those lines uh call my name is definitely my favorite um and really amongst my favorite Prince ballads of his as well. Um, then he goes on to say, uh, A Million Days has the structure of a good Prince rock ballad, but the sound of half-finished demo. Uh, I don't agree with that, but, you know, it, music is subjective. Uh, the synth that powers the opening sounds piped in from a home studio built about 20 years ago and even then it's not loud enough. Eh, you know, again, music is subjective. And two, you know, depending on what type of system you're playing it on, like then, you know, CDs were still dominant. Um, we were just kind of in the infancy of digital downloads. So, you know, the MP3 was sort of the, you know, the dominant. So if you're listening on a download, especially at that time, you know, yeah, the quality is not going to be that 
that great but again depending on what type of CD system you have whether it's in your car your home back in 2004 or both you know then you know you might have some some better results um, I really didn't have a problem with the sound of a million days but I do get with Paisley Park to me there are significant number of recordings that just to me and my personal taste I always felt were a bit too polished you know I prefer you know the Kiowa trails sound the sunset sound and that just that kind of rawness you know from you know like controversy 1999 you know the first two time albums you know I kind of dig that sort of rawness in the recording but I think kind of once you got to the later 80s like 89 90 getting into the 90s and forward yeah sometimes the production to me was a bit just too polished a little too machine but you know it, it didn't take away from my enjoyment of the music or anything like that but I disagree with his assessment of a million days but I do understand the point um, yeah his guitar and vocals are lavishly spread all over the mix but the drums are too soft and muddy so ultimately this his track comes out like a bad Lenny Kravitz throwaway elsewhere life of the party and the title track suggests nothing in Prince's life these days was born this century not only does he waste valuable time on the former making fun of Michael Jackson but the track is mired in stale funk a notch below the Martin thing that's and that's kind of cold um, yeah I mean life of the party um, to me I preferred the live version you know it, even though live it's you know James Brown's hot pants that they're playing live underneath you know I, I like that now granted you know maybe it would have been too easy to sample that or do a you know live band interpolation of that it would have been too easy and I can understand Prince going for the you know obvious of trying to make it as original as possible but I would have preferred if he was going to be as original as, pop as possible maybe not necessarily again taking the groove of hot pants but that tempo that feel and that energy I think the live version far surpasses the studio version but again it's not a bad song and it doesn't take away from my enjoyment of that album so uh, the next review is from Rolling Stone again from 2004 and this is by Anthony de Curtis and again just kind of some of the takeaways instead of reading the entire review um, here he says it's open easygoing and inclusive the sort of album anyone might like most notably musicology restores a refreshing sense of songcraft to Prince's writing rather than seeming like mere sketches as so much of his recent work has each track on the album is distinct coherent and rigorously uncluttered uh, whether it's a bluesy lament such as on the couch a lovelorn meditation like a million days or a stop time jam such as if I was the man in your life and the singer makes it clear that he has learned that rigor from the masters I uh, wish I had a dollar for every time you say don't you miss the feeling that music gave you back in the day he sings over an insinuating bass line on the title track now 45 Prince realizes and repeatedly declares that his tastes are old school on reflection one of the several ballads that float by on the sweet musical breeze reminiscent of Stevie Wonder memory sweeps Prince away remember all the way back in the day when we would compare whose afro was the roundest moments like this rescue Prince from his eccentricity and centricities 
and make him recognizable again. So this was a more positive review uh, coming from Rolling Stone, and probably the most positive in a number of years. Um, yeah, I kind of remember quite a few releases, like New Power Soul not getting a good review. I uh, can't remember what the reviews for Rainbow Children were, but yeah, this was definitely you know strong support for this album from the magazine at this point. Uh, so um, again, you know, most of the other view reviews were positive reviews and some of the strongest in a long time. And like I said, this was a a, a great album. Um, you know, I have a video. You know, I did a while back uh, called, you know, the 20, you know, 21st century Prince albums uh, did a ranking, you know, uh, you can check that video out. And yeah, musicology is pretty high. It is one of my favorites and I do consider it a 21st century classic. Um, like I said, so many great memories. Like I said, I remember, again, signing up for the mpg music club and i mean you know just that website you know that was kind of like where you know websites were kind of gaining in that popularity and they were starting to evolve a little bit and become even more interactive and more user friendly and you know giving you more bang for your buck and especially you know with that club that was ahead of its time you know that you know, before, you know, you had things like Napster at that time, um, but, you know, um, iTunes hadn't come up yet, you know, it hasn't started yet, um, I can't remember, I think, let's see, I don't even think Amazon, no, not even Amazon Music um, was around at that point, you know, so he was definitely ahead of his time with that club, and I remember, like I said, um, I think one of my first um, I think hearing about this was that was they released the track where you could go and mix it yourself, you know, kind of create your own little musicology mix. And it was just the instrumental, no vocals or anything like that. But um, I don't know. I tried it. I didn't have quite the sophisticated computer back then. So it was like I, I tried it and. I don't know. I don't think I came up with anything that was award winning or I don't I can't remember if there was even a contest. If anybody else was part of that club, uh, leave me a comment, let me know if there was a contest. But long story short, yeah, I wasn't nowhere near, you know, uh winning the contest for that. Um I, you know, getting the preferred seating tickets, you know, for uh, I think it was what I think 70 bucks I think um, and got second row for that I wish I still had my ticket too um, but yeah definitely it was you know second row uh, enjoy going to that I remember prior to that um, you know going to the one of the regal theaters uh, to see the sort of simulcast of the show in LA you know the opening night of the tour and you know that was fun you know and then it was um wasn't quite a packed house but you know there were quite a few prince fans that you know they they came and they represented and it filled enough of it to where you know it was like being at the concert practically um you know that was a lot of fun um I'm trying to think what else was it like i said the the show itself um oh also getting yeah both at the Regal Theater and also the actual concert uh, you know getting the free copy of Musicology um, which I no longer have either one of those um, this was actually a replacement from my original <laughs> CD from back in the from back in the day because I had all three I had the two from the, the two shows and then in between got the actual album so, um, and like I said, this got much play. Uh, I also even made a playlist, you know, or a CD, a burned a CD, uh, to which my playlist included selections from this, selections from uh, Slaughterhouse, selections from 
Chocolate Invasion, uh, the virtual B-Sides, Magnificent, um, which, you know, they just dropped that on streaming. And that, from this era here, that is one of my favorite songs from that era. And, you know, it's a crime that it's not on the album, actually, instead of being a virtual B-Side. But that was cool, too, because, you know, in this sort of digital age, the CD age, you know, there were no longer B-Sides, you know. So it was cool kind of getting that feeling back, too, you know, but in a 21st century form, the, the virtual B-Side. So that was a lot of fun um, getting those as well. Um, so, yeah. So from there, let's go ahead and talk about tracks. Just kind of give my, you know, brief thoughts, memories, impressions of it. Um, musicology, you know, I thought was a pretty good track. I think, to me, yeah, Prince probably could have come out some, with something a little bit heavier, a little bit stronger, you know, to make a heavier statement. But, like I said, he's at that, you know, he's now legacy artist. He's now, you know, elder statesman. And, you know, every artist kind of goes through this thing. You know, you get your, quote-unquote, your classic period now. Pay attention whether you're, you know, second, third, fourth generation fans of this because, you know, even the contemporary music you're listening to now, it's going to happen to your favorite artists too. Even Taylor Swift is going to happen to her eventually. And there's this period where you get your, you know, in your 20s to your 30s. You get this period where you just can't do any wrong. This becomes your classic period. Then, kind of when you hit your 40s, going into your 50s, then there's this little bit of a drop. You know, there's this little bit of a drop off. And only your most diehard fans are going to be your support. Or, you know, if touring, if you, you know, is able to sustain you, then you can go on tour and survive off of doing your hits. And then that mainstream, they may not be checking out your new one, but they'll show up for that concert. Now, the downside is when you get ready to do, hey, I'm going to do this song off my new album. And that's when everybody kind of runs to the bathroom or they go get a beer, they go get something to eat. And then, you know, when you finish your doing your tracks from the new album and then you go right back into your hits and they come running back. And that's just the nature of the, you know, that's just the nature of things. And you see, like, I've seen this with Prince, I've seen this with Paul McCartney, I've seen this with quite a few, even Bob Dylan, um, you know, George Clinton, um, to where, you know, there was always a consistency, but there was something that just wasn't clicking with everyone. It was probably clicking with, again, the most diehard fans, but it just wasn't clicking with the mainstream or you know it was always something and like I said you kind of hit that period your 40s your 50s and then like I said some like Prince like I said like Paul McCartney kind of when they did hit their 50s they kind of found this balance to where like okay elder statesman you know legacy artists or they found this kind of creative rebound where you know they they figured it out it's like okay well I'm not trying to compete with my classic period but I know what elements of that classic era to take and put in just enough of it to kind of draw you in and then have that balance of what worked for you then kind of with what you know you're trying to do now you know whether that's integrating contemporary sounds with it not you know trying to sound like you're having a midlife crisis but you understand how today's music works and you know how to balance it and craft great songs and have the songs stand on their own. And like I said, you know, Prince, to me, figured it out with this album. And to me, really figured it out with Artificial Age, but that's another topic for another day. But again, getting back to musicology, um, you know, I kind of like the little James Brown nod. And when you watch the video, it makes more sense why. Because that video, it shows, you know, where they have the actor playing Prince as, you know, a kid, you know, riding his bike to the record store. And we've heard that story from him where, you know, 
every time James Brown came out with a single, he'd be on his bike, you know, pay his hard-earned money, get that single, you know, put it on the handlebars and ride home and drop it on the turntable and, you know, and like I said, you know, James Brown was, he was the godfather, you know. So it, it, may, it makes more sense having that and then with uh, James Brown had being the foundation of funk, the originator of funk, um, along with Prince name checking, uh, Sly Stone, Earth, Wind and Fire, and I mean even as later as Chuck D, Republic Enemy, you know, bringing that element in. So it, it makes more sense of a song to me post video. Uh, because of that, but you know, on its own terms, like I said, I think you know, if he came back with something like with the Lindrum and you know, found a way to make it contemporary or something like a Black Sweat to me, you know, if he had come out with something like that, as bam, you know, I'm back. But considering the momentum that was built with the Grammys, the momentum with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, musicology, perfect try. All right, so the next one. Illusion, Coma, Pimp, and Circumstance. Like I said, it wasn't my favorite track on the album. And it's one that, even now, I still kind of struggle with. Uh, to me, the saving grace on this track is the rhythm guitar at the end of the track. You know, when it kind of goes into a little funky vamp at the end. You know, and it's, you know, getting ready to fade out. That kind of saves the song for me but I mean you know it's Prince's sense of humor um, you know that's one thing I'm glad has never changed you know regardless of what philosophy he adopted or what religion he adopted he still managed to keep that sense of humor so that's intact in this song and, it, and it's not a bad song and, that, and there are people that are fans of this song and that's cool but yeah, not one of my favorites but when I listen to the whole in, or the entirety of the album then I don't skip it either. You know, it's like I'm on that journey, I'm on that ride, and I do look forward to the rhythm guitar part at the end. And then the next one, A Million Days, it is one of my favorites um, on the album. Um, like I said, you know, regardless of what the review said, you know, um, I disagree. I mean, I'll listen to it again and pick out the more technical complaints about it, but. I love the track, you know, so there, and I wish we can get the video, you know, officially released, uh, and again, Life of the Party, again, with that one, I wish it had the energy, the tempo, the feel of the live version as opposed to the studio version, I prefer the studio version, but, I mean, the live version, but, again, I don't skip it. I listen to it and I enjoy it for what it is and it's still you know it's still funky on its own terms but I just would have preferred like I said more of an energy to that um, and then that goes right into call my name so that would be my second favorite and there's no real order to this I'm just going in order of the track listing but you know definitely one of my favorite ballads uh, by Prince um, one of my favorite tracks on this album. I love the lyrics. I love the video. Um, it's a winner. Uh, Cinnamon Girl, uh, which I think at first a lot of people thought he was covering. I think it's Neil Young. I think he has a song called Cinnamon Girl. And people thought that this was a cover of that. But it's an original composition. And, you know, it's... I guess you could say it's a political song, you know, this is definitely, you know, it's post 9-11, you know, here we are, it's 2004, so you're just, you know, not even, you know, it's on three years uh, since then, and, you know, a lot of that is still in our memories at the time, and it, the wounds are still fresh, and the shock is still fresh, and the world is changing, trying to figure out what kind of world we're going to be after something like that and you know this song you know it addresses you know that it addresses you know hate and it addresses ideologies and things of that nature and it's a strong track and the video to me wasn't bad um, I don't know I haven't seen it in a long time I haven't watched it in a long time 
um, but I didn't have a problem with the video, and and it's it's quite a nice it's a nice song. I enjoy the song. Um, next would be my third favorite track on the album is that, and that's what do you want me to do? And again, it's you know it's good songwriting. Again, I love the the lyrics to it. Um, you know the the music, the melody, the arrangement, the Lynn drum machine is probably my favorite part. That makes the song. I can't really hear this song if those drums weren't in it. You know, I probably wouldn't even enjoy it as much. But it's vintage Prince. It's classic Prince, but it's now. You know, it's 2004. And you know, I think what it you know what it is. I think that yeah now he's at this legacy stage and you know he's become a little more sophisticated musically and yeah and going in different directions and not only challenging us but challenging him himself so you know we're not going to get the type of funk from 1999 or dmsr or you know or head or anything you know it's kind of a different lane as much as you know we would have preferred you know if you're going to go and be in this mature direction why not take something that had that feel and not necessarily lyrically you know go back to being 20 you know or 17 or whatever don't go back but find a way to have that sound and have it be as fresh as today and show off the maturity in your lyrics with that but yeah what you want me to, what do you want me to do is kind of the perfect example of that um, the blending of classic and new and then next we have the marrying kind and if I was the man in your life those two songs to me they're kind of back and back back to back because they kind of segue so to me it always felt like one entire song instead of two different songs I thought you know it's kind of like a like an opera or a theater thing, you know, where it's start off with the one song and then you segue into the next one. You know, I thought it was something like that, but um I you know, again, I don't skip them, but I do I do struggle with listening to it like, you know, I don't rank them as my favorites. Um And then the same with On the Couch. I know a lot of people enjoy that one, but I don't know it's it's not you know like call my name is such the superior ballad on this album that I don't know maybe if call my name wasn't on this then I would enjoy on the couch better but again you know it's the sense of humor I love the uh, the love Jones reference and which I think might have been an inspiration for this track um, but it is a good ballad and there are a lot of fans of this ballad um, you know, I've heard the live version of it, I think. And, you know, I, I enjoy it. But like I said, Call My Name is the better ballad. So having that fresh in your mind and then you going into something like that, it's, yeah. And then we have Dear Mr. Man, which um, I enjoyed this track. You know, um, again, you know, political statement. Because like I said, we're, you know, this is that age where like I said there's uncertainty you know I mean it's post 9-11 you know you've had the Iraq war that just kicked off in 2003 and then um, you know of course Afghanistan so you fight you know there's all these wars on all these different fronts and you know and it's kinda just the beginning of this recession you know which kinda hit its peak in 2008 and you know we're all trying to figure out what's what's happening you know it's kind of like you know it seems like we couldn't imagine things being even worse but you know hell you know if you would have gone back in time and showed people 2020 or 2016 and you know just all the stuff that we're dealing with now you know that you know, like I said, we we got a long way to go, you know, to get to peace and love and harmony. Um, but then, like I said, those were just as uncertain times as the times that we're living in now. And 
again, this is one of those songs, you know, it's kind of Prince's sort of kind of what's going on influenced um, track. And I think, you know, it's just as relevant now as it was back in 2004. And it's a track that I do enjoy listening to. And then the final track is, again, one of my absolute favorites of this album, and that's Reflection. And I remember prior to this album coming out, the famous Tavis Smiley interview, uh, which capped off with Prince and Wendy on acoustic guitars performing the song live. And I think that made me want really, really, really want to get this album because you, you know, you kind of had musicology that was, you know, in heavy rotation, at least video wise. I don't know what it was doing on radio. Um, but, you know, the video was getting a lot of airplay and stuff. And, you know, like I said, the hype, you know, from the, you know, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Grammys, you know, just all the hype building, the tour building, the momentum, you know, so it was like, oh, and again, this is, you know, to me, this is classic era Prince too. you know, this is where, but it's now. You know, like, this could have easily had been on parade, and it could easily come out now and still have an impact, you know, on Prince fans, because, you know, it's just that great of a, of a song. And it's really, to me, one of the few tracks that I think he really became an open book. Um, there's very few times, you know, where... Yeah, you could say in his music, you can kind of guess like, oh, well, we know what he's feeling, we know what he's thinking, or we can figure out what who he is based on this song or that song. But most of those, they really kind of, you know, you kind of got the imagery and the poetry and, you know, you kind of got to do some detective work. You know, it's kind of like going through hieroglyphics, trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we get to know him through this song? And to me, I think this is one of the ones that, I think he became more of an open book and I'm glad this was on the album and it's a good good ending to the album as well so that's musicology uh, I'm gonna have to get this on vinyl one of these days um, and maybe do a comparison on this but um, yeah definitely you know this is back in print so you can get the CD you can get the vinyl um, you know, by all means. Like I said, I really wanted to give this equal time. So let me know what you think about musicology. Is it your favorite? Uh, one of your favorites? Uh, leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And that's going to end this episode of Amari Music Talk. Again, if you're on your favorite podcast platform, feel free to download. Also, if you are on YouTube, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And also become a Patreon supporter. So and until the next time, create your day, create your life. Peace.